Mike Sandridge is the first speaker. Mike, let me introduce my Mike is the past president of the Richmond Beekeepers. He was president before I was. Uh, Mike is our, one of our few part-time uh, part-timers. He actually has a pollination service that he runs along with his day drill job. He has that working for the county or state of Virginia. So Mike's going to go through the social, the whole backbone of the. Got a mic? <coughs> yeah, I'm trying to follow your presentation. No, I think, uh, go check PowerPoint and go to the last. Get it under open. See what you got up there. Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, I got social work. There we go. Uh, Act of God, our projector here is hanging in here, so we went for a spare. But uh, pretty good, Mike. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wake up. Ah! <laughs> okay, so um, my task is to teach you biology 101. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about is the basic bee biology. What's the deal with bees? You know, what what are they? How is hive made up? That sort of thing. So we're going to kind of give you some 101 on, on bee biology, kind of set the stage. There'll be a lot of talk later on about boxes and packages and how you get bees and all that stuff. But let's just talk basic bee stuff. All right, see if it works. Ah, there we go. So, honeybee, it's a bug, it's an insect, okay? They're just like every other insect. They have six legs. If you were to count them, they're all there. Uh, they have a head, thorax, and abdomen. The honeybee's head is here, thorax, abdomen. They have wings. They have what is called an exoskeleton. They are hard on the outside. They don't have bones. There are skeletons on the outside. They have jointed arms and legs. You can see little joints in their arms and legs. So they actually can manipulate things. Okay. Um, they don't have a spine or a spinal cord. Their nerves kind of meander through their whole body. They actually don't even have lungs. They breathe through little pores in the exoskeleton. As they move and expand, Air passes through those pores and into their bodies. Okay, so they're they're just like every other insect, but uh, there are some differences. Now, one of the things I'll mention here, because you can see it real well, see a little fuzz there. Unlike a lot of insects, they have the cilia on the outside of their bodies. They actually kind of like here. Okay, and those are become important later on when it comes to some of the things that they do, but. If you look at a yellow jacket, you're not going to see that. They're going to be, if you look, think about it, yellow jackets are, are kind of different looking. They got the same basic structures in their body, but they don't have this, this stuff. And so it makes them look a little different. Okay. Honeybees are unique. As Paul said, they're a social insect. They live cooperatively. They have, uh, the bees have a multitude of tasks. They have based on their, um, their gender and other things, specific duties. Um, so they, they are unique in the sense that there are a few types of insects that live this well socially. Uh, you see uh, ants, uh, honeybees, you know, are like that. You see a lot of other bees, but they're not truly social insects. They live in a group, but they're not necessarily uh, fit the same pattern um, in that there are different jobs being done by different bees, and they live in this group together and all working together to achieve the same purpose. Um, they give and store excess quantities of food. One of the reasons that the honeybee became domesticated was that um, Humans noticed that the honeybee stored not just a little bit, they stored tons of food if it was available and just kept storing it as long as they could. So they said, hmm, this is, a, this is an issue. Not only were they attracted to the honey, but one of the reasons they began um, keeping them uh, instead of just gathering from them 
was because they noticed this 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 habit. They overwinter. They don't hibernate. I will guarantee you, who's ever cut down a bee tree? Okay, there's a handful of us in here have done that. And I remember as a kid, old Shinny Chenault said, Come on, let's go get us some honey out of this bee tree. We're going to cut it down. It's winter time. Those bees are going to be gone. We cut down that tree. We both got stung. Big time. Okay? They were alive and well. They weren't sleeping. That tree hit the ground, they came out. So they don't hibernate. Um, they're the only insect that humans actually manage like livestock. And in fact, if we were to talk about the old management principles back in the pre-1800 era, we would find that they actually manage them very much like you would manage cattle. Okay? They were managed just like regular livestock. So let's talk about the bee's life cycle. And this is true of um, worker bees, drones, queens. This same pattern follows through. And if you were to follow other insects, it's a very similar pattern. In fact, it's even like a butterfly. So first of all, we have the egg. That's where it starts. Eggs in the bee, honey bees, will hatch out in a couple of days, usually about two sometimes three uh, days depending on conditions. The first stage is the larva stage. It's a little white larva. Now unlike a lot of like caterpillars that have legs and can move around, the legs on the honeybee larva are very small. It doesn't move anywhere. It stays inside this cone structure that's been built for them. It grows and once it's reached full, gro full, full growth it starts to stretch out. Okay and it will fill the whole cell. Initially, it's curled up on the bottom, then as it gets bigger, it stretches out. Once it stretches out like that, then the worker bees in the hive will cap over that cell. Okay, it's kind of like, you know, you see cocoons. Well, they get a little help here. They get a little assist from the adult bees. It's capped over, and then when that happens is inside that capped over cell, the larva will spin a cocoon, believe it or not. It spins a very small cocoon, but it's a cocoon. And then it goes into the pupa stage and it pupates and metamorphosis occurs and it transitions from being larva to an adult bee, just like with the butterfly. Once it's transitioned through, it will eat its way out of this, it'll break that cap and it will exit as a fully grown adult. So, where do bees come from? Well, they're all over the world, but the honeybee and its closest relatives <coughs> primarily come from Europe and Africa, and there's a different group that comes from Asia. The bees we keep primarily come from Northern Europe. The bees you hear so much about negatively primarily come from right down here. We'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. So, the European bee, the uh, Latin name Apius mellifera, mellifera is the European honeybee. And you'll hear there are subspecies that you'll hear called Italians, Caucasians, Carnolians. You'll hear us refer to the English bee or the German bee from time to time. And basically, they're all subspecies of the European bees. Then you have the African bees, Apius mellifera, I can't pronounce it, Scoletta. And there are a whole bunch of different varieties there, and I'll show you that in a minute and talk about that. Then Apius serrana and the Apius dorsata are both from Southeast Asia. Okay, one's a very small bee, one's an extremely large bee. Okay, so let's talk about bees of the old world that we're more familiar with. So, Apius mellifera mellifera is primarily the North European bee, often referred to as the German or the English bee. Um, they are dark bee. They're very accustomed to wet, colder climates. Um, they do very well in our climate. Apius linguisticia is the Italian bee, 
and it has been adopted as primarily the most often kept or der derivations of that bee in the United States for a lot of reasons. It's very productive, it's very gentle, and it's quite pretty. It's got the yellow bands, and everybody likes those yellow bands, yellow and black bands. So people like this, this bee. Then you got Carnicia, which are the Carnolians, the Caucasians from up here. Now, as you progress around the Mediterranean, you'll see the, the, the Syrians. Those are the ones you read about in the Bible, the places like that. That's the Middle Eastern bee. And then the, the Italians kept the, I mean, not the Italians, but the Egyptians kept this one. So as we progress even further down into this area, we're going to see the African bees. Okay, now, there are two groups of bees that, in Africa that are really tough. This group, which are the ones that you hear about so often associated with the quote killer bees. Um, and this group. These actually are meaner than these are. These are a whole lot meaner. Um, now, people ask me how come they're so mean. I'll tell you that the, most of the studies show that the reason for this is humans. What happened up here in this region was we decided to keep bees. So we killed off the bees that were mean and kept the bees that were easier to work with. In this area of the world, instead of keeping bees, they gathered from them. So it became the hunter, it's the hunter-gatherer thing. And so, which ones do you gather from? The easiest ones to deal with. You don't want to deal, you don't want to deal with the meanest ones. So what happens was, the easy ones to deal with got killed off because they gathered the honey from them and killed the colonies. And the mean ones were left to survive, the def most defensive bees. So the most defensive bees survived, and, the most, and, and they kept breeding and breeding, became more and more <coughs> defensive. And rather than being aggressive, they're defensive. They set up territorial boundaries around where the colonies are. And if you disturb, come into that boundary and disturb it, they're going to defend it. Okay? So in order to survive, they became more defensive. So we kind of selected for the more defensive bees. The cake bee down here uh, is kept in South Africa. It's a very productive bee. It's a good bee, and they, that's what they keep down there. It's a good bee. All right. Not nearly the problem these guys are. Okay. So let's talk about the fun stuff. So, in a hive, we have queen. We have workers and we have drones. Queen, drone, worker. Worker bees tend to be quite a bit smaller. They have a stinger. Drone bees are larger. They do not have a stinger. They are the male bee. And then, of course, the queen is the mother of the hive. She's the one that lays all the eggs. And all the workers and all the drones in a hive are her progeny. All right, so worker bee. Interesting. It's a female. The worker bees are all females. They're generally non-reproductive. Now that's a term generally because in some strict instances, a worker bee will lay eggs. She never mates, therefore they are infertile eggs. Because they are infertile eggs, they always develop into a grown or a male bee. Their lifespan, 45 days to four months. In some places you read up to six months, depending on, on the length of the winter and that sort of thing. Um, in the 45 day time frame is usually, that's the average, but that's usually spring, summer. And the harder they work, the faster they die. They literally burn out. Winter, we're looking at four months. Because most of their winter activity is reduced, but pretty much reduced to keeping the hive warm, maintaining things, maintain, maintain, eating the stored up foods, and uh, sustaining the hive that way. They're going to live longer. They're not flying around. They're not working themselves to death. An egg to the maturity. Now, remember I kind of described that model of the egg, the larva, the pupa, the adult. It takes 21 days 
for an egg to become an adult. Interestingly enough, it takes 21 days to hatch a chicken egg. So we go click there. Gotta keep remember. All right. So what their duties are: the worker bees do 99% of the work in the hive. The first duty a worker bee has is cell cleaning, and the first thing it cleans is its own cell that it emerged from. And it begins that process for about one or two days. That's all it does. It runs around cleaning up, being a cleaner. Provides janitorial services. Then it graduates to a nurse bee. Now, the unique part about that period of its development as a nurse bee, it is able to produce the kinds of food that are needed by the larva and uh, actually produces food that's needed by the queen like royal jelly and that sort of thing during this period. And they have glands on their bodies that are active during that time frame that produce those, those specific types of, uh, of nutrients and for their food. So during that time frame, they're acting as nurse bees. A nurse, uh, you know, it's interesting, an interesting little fact is that each of those larvae during that time frame are being fed, literally, by the nurse bees. They're bringing the food to them, they're feeding those larvae, and a larva will be examined by a nurse bee a thousand times a day. That's the rough estimate. A thousand times a day, some nurse bees will stick its head in there and check out that larva. So it's un those larvae are constantly being attended to. So the large population of nurse bees is pretty important. The advanced nurse bees are uh, usually attending to the queen and to queen cells and that sort of thing. And you'll see a picture later on of a bunch of nurse bees surrounding a queen. But they also provide a very important part of the hive. They act as the um, carrier of queen pheromone around the hive and they help keep the hive stable. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Wax production, 12 to 17 days. Key period of time. This is when all the bees' wax is produced. The bees have glands on their stomachs that produce little flakes of wax, little small flakes. So beeswax is a natural product produced from the bee itself, just like milk from a cow. The bees actually make the wax. It's not made from petroleum and oil like a lot of wax you see sold, at the you know, wax candles you see sold. At. It's just made by them. And they take that wax and manipulate it with their mandibles and with their legs, and they help they build that honeycomb. And honeycomb structure the way it is, they would build that anywhere, anytime. They don't even have to be coached to do it. They build those uh, cells perfectly and in a certain in that pattern all by themselves. It's all built in logic. Okay. Then they graduate to being guard bees. Now I used to I used to think guard bees came after foraging bees, but it, this 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 period in here can get really kind of back and forth. A forager who's confined, in other words, if it's rainy, wet, cold, and the forager's hanging out of the hive, um, well, they pull guard duty. So they, get, they don't do nothing. <coughs> so they're there, they'll act as guards as well, and they'll help defend the hive. Um, one of the things you hear about manipulation is about the time of day, the time of day you want to manipulate a hive, is when a lot of these foragers are going to be out in the field so that your guard force is reduced. And it's a whole lot easier to work with the bees. But the guard bees will be guard bees for about three days, and their job is to protect the entrances of the hive so that other creatures coming in, like bumblebees and hornets and yellow jackets, uh, uh, hive beetles, um, uh, that sort of thing, can't get in. In addition to that, they will protect the hive from larger creatures or attempt to from skunks and bears and humans. So the guards are there and they also put off something called a pheromone, it's a warm pheromone, which alerts the hive and generates it. This uh, uh, suddenly goes from, it's like the National Guard, you go from a little small nucleus of guard bees and suddenly you have an army of bees. All the foragers in the hive will suddenly become guard bees. So uh, it's kind of interesting to do that. And then about 20 days they do their foraging. They spend about 20 days going out and actually collecting honey pollen. 
Now, this picture is kind of neat because what you see right here, this is pollen. And the way it's kept on their legs is through those cilia, those hairs. They don't really actually have like a sac there. It's basically hairs that they use to uh, pack that around. They'll pack that into a bundle and they'll carry it on their legs back to the hive that way. Okay, here's another great picture. Look at all that pollen on those hairs. Okay, so the hair actually, the little, those little cilia help them collect pollen, but it's also very important for pollination purposes. So those of us who work with farmers to do large scale pollination, this picture is glorious because this is what it's all about. It's moving that pollen from uh, in the hive from the male part of the flower to the female so that uh, that, that uh, flower sets the fruit. Okay, so this kind of goes off on some of the other things we were just talking about in a little more detail. Now I'll run through them quickly. Nurse bees, one to 12 days, cleaning their own uh, cells and others, feeding brood. Um, this breaks down to those first two things I was talking about. The house bee, which is a general term for all the, bee, all the bees that are working in the hive for the first 20 days. You got comb building, housekeeping, undertaking. That's a great one, the undertaking part. And one of the fun things to watch, it's kind of fun. But you see the bees bring out, bring out the dead kind of deal, okay? And you watch two or three of them, they're dragging this dead bee out, and they get to the edge of the thing and they just kind of toss them over the side. And you go, man, it's an unceremonious funeral, uh, I, I tell you. Um, ripening honey is a cr critical element. The climate control and ripening honey are very important um, uh, for the hive. They maintain the colony at a certain level of humidity and a certain heat all year round. Okay? When it's really hot in the summer, they'll go collect water and they'll air condition the hive. When it's really cold in the winter, They'll cluster together and generate heat to warm the hot. So the, the, the climate control is key for both the brood, because the brood has to be kept warm above 60 degrees. It's kind of like the chickens, chicken sitting on her nest to keep the eggs warm. Or you, as you've been to the state fair, you've seen the eggs in the brooder, you know, and the eggs in the incubator, keeping the eggs warm. They got to be maintained. Certain humidity, certain temperature. Same thing goes on in the hive. Then you got the uh, ripening of honey. Um, are we going to talk about? Are they going to talk about honey sometime? Paul, are going to talk about that? Uh, go into it, Mike. I don't think okay. So the ripening of honey. Honey, the nectar doesn't come out of the plants automatically. Honey, even after they deposit the cells, it's still got a big process to go through, and it's called dehydration. The honey actually has a, like 17% uh, of water in it, only about 17%. It's the important part about what makes honey preserve so long is that it's a very dense sugar solution, very, very dense, low water, and the, lower, the low water keeps it from being fermented, and that dense sugar will kill the bacteria. And it will maintain that way for two or three thousand years as long as it doesn't absorb warm moisture. So what we found is, for example, when they open up tombs in Egypt and there's honey in there, and a lot of times they, they sent their loved ones off with a jar of honey, which was a good thing. Um, that honey's still good after three thousand years, just like it was. It hasn't changed a bit. It's been kept dry, it's stable, it's still good as it was three thousand years before. So it's very long term. So the ripening of the honey is important. And it's important to the bees because by ripening that honey, they preserve it. It's like smoking meat. It's like salting meat. It's like freezing stuff. For them, that's their process of preserving their food so their food will sustain them longer and doesn't go bad. Okay. Uh, we talked about the wax. We talked about pollen a little bit. Um, the difference between the two things that they need to live off of. Honey is their carb. Pollen is their protein. So just like us, they have to have we have to have carbohydrates and protein to make our bodies function and to give us energy 
and to keep us built, you know, built up and strong, so do bees. They need the pollen and they need the honey. Protein and carbon. Higher security, we talked a little bit about that. Here's a cute little thing called orientation flights. So during that guard phase, what you'll start to see is the bees will practice orientation flights. They will go out and fly around in front of the hive. Up, down, back, or sometimes they even look like robbers. What they are doing is imprinting the location of the hive. And there are several things that these bees are looking for. One is they're looking for specific landmarks. Okay? There's a, a blue marker or it's got a color box in there or something like that. And they'll register in that landmark so they can identify the hive. The second thing they're also doing is for navigational purposes. They're, they're imprinting the location of the sun in reference to the hive at different times during the day. They will imprint that. So when people say, how do the bees find their way back? That's how. They've imprinted, they've done their own GPS. They know the location of the hive based on the reference points of the sun and the time of the day. And they can identify the box from other boxes, but based on landmarks around the box. You can really mess them up if you change the landmarks. Okay? All right. Uh, we haven't talked about the field agents. Uh, okay. So that's another picture of the same thing. And when you get to talk about actually keeping bees, that stuff is pretty important information to know. All right, so lifespan of a drone. Drones live a little long. They don't do that much. They only have one purpose in life. That's to mate with a unmated queen. They actually act as the means of a queen to transmit her DNA to other queens for reproduction purposes. It is a weird kind of way of thinking about breeding. But a drone only has the genetic material of the queen. Now, she's got both X and Y that came down because she's, she, she came from a fertile leg. But her genetic material that X and Y is passed through to that drone. That drone only carries that. It doesn't carry any other uh, biological material from the drones that that queen mated with. Only the worker bees have that. So this one only reflects the queen itself. It takes 24 days. How many days did I say for the worker? 21. 21. It takes 24 days for a drone. It takes them a little longer to come out of that cell. Okay? Again, the only purpose they serve is to mate with the queens. This time of year, you won't see many drones. In fact, you probably won't see any. One of the things that happens is winter comes along, drones don't serve a purpose. There are no queens ready to mate during the winter. Drones aren't needed. Food is in short supply, and the drones get the food. They get the food for themselves. It's kind of sad to watch them kick up. I won't let them back in. <laughs> they kick them out. Okay, queen. Only fertile female in the hive. She's the only one that's supposed to be laying eggs. She's the only one that's mated female. All right. Her lifespan is much longer. Three to five years. Part of that's because she has a lot of attendants. All these girls are nurse bees. See them all around her? They feed her. They take care of her. You know... Her job in life, though, is really one job, lay eggs. She's kind of a factory egg layer. Her peak, peak productive life, one to two years. So what we typically see now with queens is that during the first year and a half to two years, they do really well. It's kind of interesting to watch the pattern, though. Towards the end of the two-year period, it's like she's laying crazy. Everybody's going, man, I got a great queen. Look at all the eggs she's laying. She's wonderful. And all of a sudden they go back one day and the queen is gone and there are no eggs in the hive. And, and it's kind of like that last burst. And so a lot of times I tell beekeepers, watch out for that because you see that big burst and all this brood, you know, and she looks like she's going great. You know she's been around a couple of years? Get ready to replace her. You probably need a new queen. Um, 
Egg to maturity, 16 days. This is important because this is the window. If, they, if the bees naturally replace a queen, where no eggs are being laid in the hive. Now the impact of that is a population impact. So for 16 days you got this gap where there are no more bees you know, in that progression. So you're going to have this window of 16 days. And now that sometimes is good, sometimes it's bad. The good part was that it does break cycle with some pests like varroa mite, okay, because it gets into their reproductive cycle. <clears throat> On the other hand, that 16-day window break can leave you vulnerable for honey collection, which leaves the hive vulnerable in the winter because they have enough food and that sort of thing. So when that occurs, it can have a real big impact. Um, all right, mentioned pheromones. We'll talk more about that later. But the fact that the queen produces these pheromones and gives them off is a very important part of how the colony kind of stays cohesive socially and stays together. Those pheromones are critical. And one of the things that this, these nurse bees are doing, not only are they attending to her and clean, but they are getting, gathering her pheromones and as they move around the hive, they spread her pheromones around the hive as they meet other bees. And that kind of, everybody knows, that's one of the ways they communicate the, Queen is in the hive and doing well, and everything is everything is in sync through that. It's a communication means. So what happens when she's not there is that pheromone doesn't get delivered. One of the interesting things you'll see with a hive that doesn't have a queen, you'll pop the top and you hear this roaring sound, and the bees are fanning their wings very hard for no real good reason. I mean, it's not hot or anything else, but they're doing it. What they're doing is they're trying to get that pheromone and trying to find, they, they know there's something wrong. They can't, the pheromone's not there. And the brood that produces pheromone as well isn't there. So all these pheromones that normally keep a colony focused and oriented aren't there and they're fanning their wings to try to, to pull that, you know, find that smell and they can't get it. They can't get it moved through the hot. So that's a real big indicator. We usually use it as a trigger point. All right, and I was talking about those. These are the chemicals that she gives off. Um, we've actually analyzed those. It's pretty kind of interesting, but that's about as far as it So let's talk about reproduction. I kind of talked a little bit about it, but you have to think of bees and a beehive as an individual. The beehive as the cow or the goat or the chicken. You think of it that way, not individual bees. The individual bees are kind of like the cells of an animal. They're the parts. They make up the parts. So bee population, colony strength, the size of the person or the chicken or the cow is dictated by the queen laying eggs and building up workers, numbers of workers. This is part of the reproductive part. You got the size of the numbers of bees. The way the species reproduces isn't this way, it's this way. It's called swarming. Okay? Swarming by definition is when a hive splits and a large body of bees moves as a unit from the location they were at. Okay? It's the splitting fact. It's the splitting, it's that large body of bees. So when people talk about a swarm, they're talking about a large body of bees. And they move cohesively together. Okay. What it is is when a hive gets strong enough and big enough, it fills up usually the space that it's in. And the queen then becomes restricted to where she can lay eggs. And the population can't grow anymore. Then like the amoeba or like other things, it splits into two. And what will happen is the swarm will consist of the old queen and approximately a third to half of the bees in the hive, usually closer to half. The remaining bees stay behind with a new queen, 
who emerges usually out of the queen cell about one or two days after the old queen is forced out of the hive. And it's, the whole process is also very detailed and interesting, but they literally, the hive as a unit will stop feeding the queen. She'll stop laying eggs. She'll thin now so she can fly again because before when she was laying eggs at full tilt, she wasn't flying nowhere. They trim her down, they get her to a place where she can fly again, and they literally run her out of the hot. They force her out. She didn't just go out on her own. Once she's out of the hive, then she starts moving to a new location. All the bees rush with her, and the process takes off. It's really kind of amazing. And pheromones play a big role in this as well. Okay? So they'll cluster together in a big bunch, looks like a big giant pine cone, sometimes is the way to describe it on a low branch within a few hundred feet of the old colony. And within three days, they will find a new place to go live. And they will go in to this new place and you will establish a colony. And the process starts all over again. Now, one of the things I'll mention is that um, what, what are they looking for for a new home? Now, since we're raising European honeybees, they have a little different definition of what is a good place to live. So by definition, a good place to live is in a tree. That's hollow. That's at least as high up where the entrance point is so that it's above most of your predators you can't just simply reach in. Okay? It's got a defined small entry point or exit points. We have several of them, but they're easily protected. It has nice, big, thick wooden walls that surround it, okay? And a cavity large enough that they can raise brood and store honey to get through the winter. So what these guys will do is they will send our foragers, who then act as scouts, who will go and look all over the place. And they'll find this place that they like. And they'll start coming back. Now, what will happen, it's kind of a group thing thing, it's kind of interesting to watch, is just like they can communicate, and I don't know if I've met, I didn't mention this earlier, it's called the bee waggle dance. Bees will find a good pollen or nectar source and they'll come back to the colony and communicate to other foragers where that location is. They can tell them by the angle of their dance, by the size of their dance, it's like a figure eight. The bigger the figure eight, and according to the angle, tell, they can tell the other bees the angle from the hive, based on the sun, and the distance away. So the other foragers can go out and find the same location and find that nectar source and bring it back. Okay? And depending on the angle, it tells them which way to go. Now, when they do this, they do the same thing. They come back, they found a great place to love. And they do this dance. So these foragers, other foragers go back out and check it out. And they come back and do the same dance. A couple more guards come back and do the same dance. Next thing you know, they're all doing the same dance. Next thing you know, they're all moving to another location. It's an amazing process. And it's amazing that they can communicate. It's part of being a social insect. All right. So, what we've talked about. We've talked about the three different components of the social order as far as the types of, of the, the bees in the hunt. You got the drones, you got the queen, and you got the worker bees. Who does all the work? Females. 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 There you go. <laughs> the worker bees. The worker bees are all females. In real life. Yep. <laughs> real life stuff. How many days for maturity of an of a egg to an adult for a worker bee? Um, 20. 21 days, very good. How many for a drone? 24. 24. How many for the queen? 16. Okay. You know, you can tell it's really important that that queen get out of the queen mature quickly because they can't afford a 21 day gap in egg production. What would happen if you had a 21 day gap or longer in egg production? You'd end up with collapse. Because the population would drop to a point 
that the hive would collapse. One of the things you keep hearing me talk about is population density, and it's a really important factor. You've heard of colony collapse disorder. That's a disorder. It is a word, it, the phrases is designed to describe what happens. Colony collapse can, occurs when the population drops to a point that you don't have enough workers to do all those jobs we just talked about. They can't maintain the brood, they can't maintain the climate, they can't feed, they can't take care of the queen. When all that started, and they don't have the bees to collect any more food, when they reach those population dynamics and the population gets that small, the colony collapses and it dies. Eventually it just dies. It just dissipates to one or two bees and eventually none. Okay? So with our, all that with all, our, all those dynamics playing in together and that social work, all those bees working together, all those workers pulling those jobs together, with our population of workers that can do all those things, the colony doesn't survive. So it's a big, that's the big thing about the social work. Okay, so I'll answer, entertain and answer a few questions now. I've got a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. You didn't mention the Russian bees at all? The Russians are uh, the Ukrainian bees. Let me see if we can go back. I'll point out the... Okay. They are part of the... They are from this area. Uh, they're part of the Caucasian uh, variety. But they're typically called Russian because of where they come from. Yes, sir. Uh, once the... Uh, count these swarms, uh, how do you capture them to start another hive? Um, I don't know if anybody's going to talk about that. It's a pretty simple process. You get a box, you shake them in it. Why do you give them in the box? <laughs> you cut off the branch, you take a bucket, shake them in the bucket, you dump them in the box. It, 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 you basically just shake them in there. Once you get that queen in that box, the rest of them will fall. Yes, that was my question. That was your question. If you can sense that it's happening because of the home or, or whatever, um, can you, if you have a separate setup, a second setup there that's just completely empty, would they gravitate to that or is that not quite right? No, go the other way. No. Sorry. See that? That's exactly what happens. <laughs> A swarm. One of my my hives swarmed and moved into an empty box, literally. Just found it, found the box empty. It was perfect location. That's what they were looking for. They moved right in. Um, you gotta love catching swarms that way. There are a lot of different things you can do to prevent swarming and to control it. One of which is I think somebody may talk about making nooks and that sort of thing. It's kind of advanced beekeeping, but a little more advanced. Um, but basically, you're 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 doing your own, you're managing the swarming. You're actually creating a swarm. Rather than allowing the bees to actually do it, you take bees, frames, brood, so separate them from the mother colony, reduce the population, give them empty space, and then they won't swarm. Um, if you have swarm traps, or you have empty boxes, sometimes they'll occupy them, sometimes they won't. If you're gambling with that sort of thing. But if when you see them swarm, you pretty much see that cloud of bees leave and, and you watch it go by and you go, wow. And you can follow it where it lands and go from there. What really is annoying is when they land in a tree about 60 feet up. It's, you know, it's like, see like, Yes, sir. If um, the bees are more comfortable getting high above the ground, how long the hives are set on the ground? Most typically you won't see us set them on the ground. We usually have them on stands about two to three feet off the ground. It's mainly for our purposes to work them. Um, bees will adapt to that, but their natural inclination, if you go look in the woods for a, uh, for a bee tree, you're not going to find a bee tree typically with an entrance down here. The entrance is going to be up here somewhere. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, with the, uh, the swarm, the queen is, has aged to some point. How much more life? It depends. It's very, very dependent on the age or when she swarms. Usually, sometimes they do it in the first year. She's got a good year, okay. and sometimes she's towards the end already. 
Yes, sir. Is it much different than the productivity of the different varieties like your Raja and your Dye's? There is a difference in their behavior. I mean, they're all, they, they do have some unique things. Um, uh, for example, the Melifera Melifera, which is the North European bee, the German or the English bee, they're black bee and they tend to be much more defensive. Okay? They tend to be, you know, when, they, when you get, get them riled up, they're going to stay riled up. They tend to be very good at wintering in wet, cold climates. They don't collect as much nectar, I think, as the Italians, but you know they're okay, all right. And they survive; they're good survivor bees. The Italians are, are easier to work with. They're good collectors. Um, they're great, you know, a great bee, and that's why they they came in here in the late 1880s and brought the first ones in, and they replaced the English bee. Before that, we pretty much kept all North European bees. The Caucasians. I find are good bees, but uh, and they but they tend to be propolizers as do as do all the other types of East European bees like the Russians. And propolis is basically they collect from trees the sap and they process it and it makes a sticky uh, glue that they glue the hive together with. I mean, you you'll fight propolis on a regular basis because they'll glue everything up. Um, one of the things about I don't know they'll probably talk about it in the beehive thing, but there's a thing called the bee space, and what honeybees will do is they will not build either wax comb or propolis in the bee space. It's about a, about a quarter of an inch. Now, if it's smaller than that, they'll propolize it. If it's bigger than that, they'll build beeswax in it. And it's that it's and it's because of that that the factor we're able to build movable frame hives, knowing that piece of knowledge. So based on their characteristics, there we manipulate that and use that characteristic to, to do, do our management. Okay, other questions? I have a question about the, the queen replacing the queen. Yeah. I mean, obviously you're not going to go into the hive very often in the winter. No. So how, I mean, how? Yeah, winter's a big gamble event. Yeah. So you want to go into the winter with the queen that you feel is going to make it through the winter. And typically the buildup for the spring begins in February, early March. Um, we call it starving time. Usually in that period of time, um, they will go through whatever stores they have left. And um, a lot of times you have a high that's on the margin as far as food stored up for the winter. It'll do fine until it gets to the end of February. And when that queen starts laying lots of eggs and they have to feed all that brood, they start going through the food very quickly and they actually starve to death in March, not in the dead of winter. So you have to be kind of tuned into that. But um, yeah, I've lost hives. The queen came out of the winter and she wasn't, she didn't do anything. Um, and right then, it's really hard to get a new queen. Uh, it's hard to find queens because even down in the south, they're not producing a lot of queens until the end of March. You don't start to see a lot of queens. So it can get pretty tricky. So you want to go into the fall with a queen that you think is, you know, a year or two old, um, that is solid in her laying capacity, is doing well. A lot of times, you know, uh, even if they replace the old queen, it's a new queen from that summer, that sort of thing, you're in pretty good shape. Um, but you want to enter the fall. That's why fall requeening, you'll hear people talk about fall requeening. They'll requeen, put a new queen in the hive in August or early September so that... So, and they'll kick the other one out? Uh, they yeah. off with their head, yeah, kind right. of. Okay. Yeah. Very Henry the Eighth kind of thing. Yes. Do they normally have just one species with them? No. Or do they? Do I will they tell you, most of mine are mutts because oh. I've got so many varieties yeah. and species all mingled together. And mutts do pretty well. Probably the better thing. Yeah. The, one of the. Um, Jeanette, how much more time I got, Paul? Am I running out of time? Ten minutes, yeah. Okay. One of the interesting components about the genetics here um, and some history. Um, package bees became a big thing beginning in the 1950s. Okay. And one of the and the government promoted it. And 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 the reason why was to reduce disease. What, we're trying, what we found was disease is carried on comb most often. You'll get bacteria. And the thing they were most concerned about was foul brood. 
okay, American and European foul brew. And the American foul brew was the number one concern, and they were trying to reduce that. So they promoted getting bees from breeders who did nothing but produce the bees. And all you got was a package of bees. You can still get them today. I actually go get them, get them from Georgia every spring and bring them back and sell them to folks in the club as well as my own. And they would literally shake the bees off the cone. And so you get a box with nothing but bees in it. So you reduce that, that vector of the wax, carrying contaminated wax that may have disease in it, like foul brood, that sort of thing. So the government promoted that extensively. Now one of the bad parts about it was that the numbers of breeders, you know, they had this image of thousands of bee breeders out there doing this. Well, it literally became hundreds, and now it's not even hundreds. And so what's happened, the genetic diversity of what was being produced got thinner and thinner and thinner. All right. So one of the problems we have today is trying to reverse that trend. Because um, what we ended up doing was relying on a handful of breeders across the South for almost all of our bees, and so therefore reduce the genetic varieties, genetic variation. That's changing to some degree. Um, we're seeing a lot more folks in the northern areas doing this, Ohio, and North Carolina, and Kentucky, here in Virginia some. Um, you'll see more nooks than you're seeing in uh, packet, as many nooks as packages these days. So that's kind of getting that mix going again, but the mix is important genetically to protect us against um, diseases. One of the problems you get with these big guys that have thousands of hives, and they've kind of got one breeder, and they've got one source of bees, and so a disease comes through, it hits them all. And suddenly you go from 1,000 hives to 200. Okay? So when you're, you know, that kind of thing causes a real problem genetically. So we're, we're working against that now. And I think we're going to see some improvements in it, but that helps. That's why I say it must sometimes do better. Um, yes, sir? When you get a package, how old is the queen typically? She's, she's a new queen. She'll be a brand new queen. They're breeding the queens. Um, typically, the, the, the queen has already uh, been tested. She's been in a breeder. Um, there's a whole breeding process. And, but the bottom line is they've had her in a mating note. She's been mated. She's laid some eggs. You know, they know she's fertile before she, she's packaged with the package. And she's sent with it. She's a new queen. Usually comes in a pet little queen cage with several uh, workers, um, nurse bees, and then she's inserted into this mass of bees that have been shaken off. And usually, when I bring a package back, she's been in there for about 24 hours with the bees, and then usually by the time I, you know, we get them distributed, people get them put in, it's in a couple of days. So she's been with, associated with them for several days before, before you put them into the hive. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. And what if these queens from a domestic hive go off and successfully live in the wild? Oh, yeah. Colony? Yeah. Yeah, do it all the time. What was the question? Can a, a queen from a domestic hive that's been bred go off and live successfully as a feral col with a feral colony on the swarm, right? And the answer is yes. Other questions? Great. Well, thank you, and um, I'll turn it over to Paul. Good. Thank you. Good. Good, sir. I, I found this this morning. I was showing this to the guys in the back. And when you start to hear prices about things, it'll freak you out a little bit. But this was August 1953. This is was a doc, a book that was published by AI Root. AI Root's a big uh, candle maker. Well, AI Root was also a big into uh, promoting beekeeping because their candles were made with beeswax. And so they, they actually had a the side of their business actually made boxes and things like that. So they used to publish this book. And I was looking at it in terms of prices. The price of a jar, one pound jar of honey in 1953 was 35 cents. Of course, the price of a package of bees was $2.50. Try $75 to $80 now, maybe $100. So it has really gone up in 60 years. 
All right. Well, very good. Thank you. Mike is, like I said, Mike is certainly a wealth of experience, and uh, experience has a long ways to go. You can have your knowledge, but Mike has it both. Mike has the bio biological knowledge, and he has the experience, and uh, this makes for tremendous speaking. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule right now. It's, uh, I suggest we probably move into the break and take about a 15-minute break right now because I think everybody's been seated long enough. I do want to ask the fair clause. I need to get your information about the fair clause. I know we get your payment, but we didn't gather your information. So will the fair clause hold your hand up? Or? Oh, okay, very good. That's all I ask. Let's go ahead and take our 15-minute break here and we'll start with the